five, five, four, three, two, one. Good evening and welcome to the special edition of Showtime TV Productions Incorporated. I'm your host, Omar Rasada. This is a very special program of arts and culture. And today's topic of discussion is one-on-one -on -one with a famous writer and a famous actress. And listen, y'all, I had the opportunity to act with this famous lady. So, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm pumped up. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Tiffany Joyner, good evening. And thank you for being a guest on tonight's program. Thank you so much, Omar. I really appreciate the invitation to join you tonight. Thank you. No, no problem at all. No problem at all. So we, we met back in uh, 2001. We were in uh, a play together by Ms. Rhonda Graham called Finally in Business. And that's how you and I uh, first met. So um, let's start um, with, uh, you, you're an actress and, and you're also a writer. So let's start off with, with the, act, the acting aspect. Um, how, how did you get involved in acting? Wow. Um, I've always had a desire to be on stage because I love the story and I love being part of the story. Um, when I was about 12 or 13, um, a neighbor of mine invited me to participate in a church play that she had written. And I was to play, I think I was the, like the drunk neighbor or something. <laughs> and I was like 12 or 13. And I, um, I mean, from that experience, just playing that role, a role that was so different from who I was as an individual, um, it just, it start, acting just began to just really intrigue me. And like I said, I always enjoyed being part of the story. I loved hearing stories. I loved partaking in them. And so at the ripe age of 12, 13, um, from then on, I was just interested in being on stage and being part of the story. And, um, you know, uh, through college, I did a production of Colored Girls, um, for Colored Girls Who Considered Suicide When the Rainbow Was Enough. Um, I did that throughout college. I did some um, community theater once I graduated. And um, relocated to Pennsylvania and um, all the way into probably my like maybe 20 years stretch in I you know just really um, just found that that was my place on the stage so um, no I, I remember I, oh I'm sorry go ahead I'm sorry no no that, that's that's pretty much it um, I just found my place on the stage I loved it um, however, you know, reality for me kind of sunk in, you know, bills weren't getting paid and things were happening that were kind of unpleasant. Mm -hmm. And I had to make a shift and had to sort of um, pivot to um, something that I knew could bring in a steady income. So I switched to education. So that's sort of where I'm at now. But I'm sorry, you're going to ask me some more about the writing or the acting? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I recall right after Finally in Business, uh, you directed a play at the Wilmington Drama League where we had Finally in Business. Uh, it was, um, it refreshed my memories, uh, A Day Without Black People. Was, uh, that's oh, A Day of Absence. A Day yeah. of Absence, yeah. 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 So, so, so talk about your directing experience, if, you know, with, with that play and any other additional plays that you have done. Sure, sure. Oh, wow. Um, directing. Well, I directed Day of Absence. That was a wonderful piece. Um, I think, um, I forgot the author's name, but um, gentleman, I think his last name was Douglas Turner Ward. I'm not quite sure, um, okay. but directing was wonderful because some of the actors that I was working with were people that I had worked with on stage. And um, just being on the opposite end from the director side and sharing my vision, um, you know, instructing people on my vision of what I foresaw would be best on the stage. It was, it was a great experience as well. Um, you know, but I, I always felt my true roots were being in or part of the story as opposed to being right. on the outside looking in. But it was a unique experience just to see what it felt like to be on on the other side of things. Um, directing, um, I directed a children's play while I was in my undergraduate at college, um, Your Good Man, Charlie Brown. I directed that and that was my first time working with children um, on, this, on the stage and that was wonderful. Um, and then I've mainly, mainly, um, just acting, but th those were maybe the two directorial pieces that I, that I did. Right. Have you ever uh, done any producing or was it just directing and acting? Uh, no producing. Um, I am open and interested, but i never have been, um, never have really thought about that and what, what that entailed. But again, I am open because I love the stage. I love being a part of what goes on on the stage. So I am open to that realm of the theater. Now, is there, now, have you currently been involved in any plays? Uh, no, uh, no, it's been, it's been a long time um, since I've acted. Okay. I do miss it greatly. Um, but, you know, I just, 
after a while, I just started taking a back seat to that because I felt that there was um, some words or a story that I wanted to tell. Okay, and okay. Um, since I've been off the stage, I've written um, three plays. Um, one of them I wrote when I was a teacher in New Jersey. Um, it's called Voices, a Christian play dealing with um, eight women from the Bible and the role that they played in the Bible and the choices that they made and how those choices impacted mankind. Um, for example, we have Eve you know, and of course, you know, what, what her choice is, you know, it impacts mankind. And then we have several other women throughout the Bible and they come together and they're put on trial and it's about their voice. Uh, that's one piece. And then I did another piece um, I wrote called Apologies for the Living. It's about the power of forgiveness and how we should make attempts to um, rectify any um, ill will we have to for toward people while they're here. That's why it's called apology or apologies are for the living. And then the third and final piece that I wrote is called the corn crib. And it deals with a woman in the South um, who takes care of her sister who's mentally challenged. And in the South, um, this is um, based somewhat on a story my father told me. Okay. He said when people in, when he was growing up, when people had mental issues and um, families were embarrassed, they would take them and they would put them in this shack where they housed or kept or stored corn and they called it the corn crib. And they would put these, their relatives, the people that they were ashamed of, that when, when company would come over, they would put them in this crib, lock the door. And then when the company would leave, they would release their family member from this actual shack. And there was a lot of things going on in there. I mean, there was insects, there's snakes, there's rats, um, and it's traumatic. I mean, you're already dealing with mental health issues and then to right, be traumatized right. with all of these other external factors. And um, it just tells this woman's story of having to do that to her sister and the trauma that she experiences by doing it. Um, that's a one woman show. Um, and I've, I've directed that and had other people um, play that role. and. Um, one day I, maybe I'll get the courage enough to become the actress, but I just, I can't muster it. <laughs> That's one of my little, one of my little fears. I, I'm, I, I guess looking at the idea of captivating an audience for 90 minutes. That's like, I feel like if I could do that role, I could probably tackle anything, but right now I'm still kind of a little hesitant. <laughs> okay, I, I want to go back to your second play when you talk about uh, the topic of um, forgiveness. Yes, you know that that's you know that that's that's very serious because some people don't find it hard to forgive others. So some of us we, we hold grudges for years and years. Yes. and as you said, forgive the person when they lie because you may be so upset at the person, and then someone may pass away, and you never have the opportunity to 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 forgive. Um, is that something that that, that you discuss in your play? Or deal with in the play? Oh yes, um, it's you know it deals with a family um, who's dealing with um, forgiving one another and forgiving themselves because the main person um, that they're ang that they're angry at that has caused all of this confusion and disruption has died, mm. and now oh. they have to come. Yes, and they have to come to terms with she's dead, but now we're still here. And we're still holding grudges against each other, but she was at the core of, of all of this um, confusion and, you know, just drama. And so now we have to make it right. She's not here. So let's make it right while we're still here. And that's something actually, it, it's semi-autobiographical. Um, and I wrote it because um, I had had a falling out with a girlfriend of mine in my late twenties. Okay. And it was clearly my fault. I, I, you know, I don't try to push it on anyone else. It was me. Okay. And I said to myself for years, we didn't talk. And like I said, it was me, it was my pride. It was my shame that I, I didn't feel I could go to her. And I said, God forbid, what if something happened to her? Mm -hmm. And I never get the opportunity to make amends with her. We were friends from high school. Oh, so y'all go back. Yes, yes. And here I am, you know, and and this was like in my 30s, I guess. And I was still like, still holding on to this. And like I said, it was clearly me. I knew it was me. Mm -hmm. And I finally mustered up the courage to write her a note about 
10 years ago. And she said, Tiffany, I, I, I put that behind. But Tiffany hadn't put it behind. Tiffany was still holding on to that. Mm -hmm. And it's ironic that we're talking about this play now because last month we met for the first time oh, in wow. 22 years. Wow. And um, that it was powerful. It was powerful. And um, I said, oh my goodness, I could have, I've lost all of this time. But you know what? We're still here and we can still move forward and we can still you know, make amends, even though we've lost so much time. Mm -hmm. And that's, hence, that was the reason why I had written this play, because okay. I was still hurting from that experience. And I think a lot of the work that I write comes, unfortunately, I don't know if a lot of writers go through this, but a lot of times when I write my best mm -hmm. is when I'm at my lowest and oh. when I'm hurting the most. I know that's, that sounds strange, but that's when I feel I produce my strongest pieces from the heart is when I'm hurting and when I feel emotionally attached to the subject that I'm writing about. Right. So let me ask you, when we, after 22 years when y'all met, was there a sense of uh, relief? Yes, it, 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 you know what, it's funny because three months before we actually met, I spoke with her like in July over the phone I mustered up the courage to reach out to her and get her phone number. And I think I felt the most relief then because I was Thank now you. connecting with her. Right, right. So when I saw her, it wasn't as like, whoa, because I'd already spoken to her three months before and we had been talking a little bit, you know, since that converse, since that first interaction. Um, so it wasn't as much because when I first spoke with her three months ago, I mean, I was so distraught. I mean, I sobbed, I was like overwhelmed in a good way. I was just so relieved. That's when the relief came. Okay, got you, got you, got you. So, I mean, I know you haven't been acting in a while, but during your time as an acting, and if you ever get back to acting, is there a particular role or roles that you refuse to do because of your uh, morals and values? Ooh, you know what? Um, <laughs> um, yes, there are roles. Um, hmm. Ooh, um, I think the roles that I would feel most or I would refuse are roles that would go against who I am as a Christian woman. Um, you know, I've played, I played a woman that was in prison before. Um, and that really wasn't, I mean, she had committed a crime, but it, I mean, on some level, a lot of us have done wrong. We've sinned in our life. But I think there's a parameter that I just can't cross. And I think one of them is, um, I think it's wrapped up in um, sexuality, um, if you know what I'm referring to. I just don't think those roles are, I could be equipped to play those roles where I would be forced to sort of um, go outside of who I am as, um, you know, a, a woman who is attracted to the opposite sex. Um, oh you know, I, I don't think I could do a role where I was, you know, in, you know, intimately involved in someone of the same sex. Um, that would be challenging for me. Um, I, I don't, and, and like I said, I, I don't want to offend <laughs> or anything like that. It's just that who I am as an individual, I don't think I could do that because in the back of my mind, I would be thinking, you know, um, the people that are watching this that know me, you know, um, what are they thinking? And what does this say about me outside of who I am as, right. you know, as a Christian? Like, what would, what would people say? How would, what would that say to my testimony? So I'd be very reluctant. Um, and um, I think that's just probably one role or one or role where it would cause me to, um, take off my clothes. That's another thing. I just couldn't do that either. Um, I, I pride myself on who I am and um, this is my vessel and I don't want to expose that to the world. It's not for the world to see. So I think those are two instances where my um, sexuality would be compromised or um, I would be forced to show my, my physical body on stage. Those are two instances where of roles where I would refuse. 
Right, right, right. So we, before we before we, we get into Tiffany, the writer, um, just uh, one last question about the acting aspect. You know, Broadway yeah. is back open. Is, the Broadway is back open. Open, open I think, uh, this month, I believe. Um, so in New York, they have seven uh, African-American plays for the first time running at the same time on, on Broadway. So, so what, what, what do you feel about you know, just a theater opening back up, not just, not just on Broadway, but in Philadelphia, in, in New York. Of course, there's protocols, you might be uh, fascinated, vaccinated, you know, you wear your mask, but the, 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 the aspect of it being open, I mean, makes many actresses and actors uh, very happy. Yes, um, I think it's a great thing to get people back on the stage, get them back into their livelihood and being in their craft, being creatives. Um, I would also, you know, I, I've been really thinking about it. I would like to get back on the stage as well. But going mm -hmm. back to your initial question, um, I think it's a good thing. I think um, the world without arts is um, right. is a world that's just it's it's not quite the same. Um, those those stories need to be told, and the fact that they were shut down for so long um, that's that's hard on the people that thrive on that in terms of the actors. And those people that enjoy sitting and, and getting that story and being a part of the experience, Definitely. you know, um, both are, are, are lacking on both ends. And so I'm glad that now we have the opportunity to be part of that story. And I'm happy that we have the actors that can tell the story. I think it's a good thing. Right, right. And not only the actors, the producers, the directors. Yes, the staff, everyone. The Sound people, the tech people. <laughs> exactly, Every, I, everyone I, I, I lost, gets. Uh, yeah, I didn't realize, you know, because I'm an actor and a playwright. So the people, you know, they, they don't think about the behind the scenes thing when they look at theater. I mean, they, they see the actors, they see the stage, but there's lightning, there's, there's sound. Yes. There's people, there's people that is makeup artists. I mean, it's, it's, it's just a whole, so much. whole family. <laughs> yeah, so much that's involved. The cop, people that do the costumes, that's like right, essential, right. the props. The pieces Definitely. that we move about on the stage. Oh my goodness! That you know, everyone is instrumental in that. If it's a musical, it's even more. We have the musicians and. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love musicals. Oh, yeah. oh my goodness. Yeah, yeah, I've read all that good stuff. Yeah, yeah. So writing. So uh, talk about your what writing background. How did you get involved with, with writing? Wow, um, it's it's interesting with that because um, as a small as a child um, going to going to school, um, we had an assignment and we had to do a poem. And, you know, I just in my mind just figured I would just compose something and I wrote a poem. It was about um, winter or the seasons. I wish I still had that poem. I don't know where it is, but it was about the seasons. And I remember writing it and reading it back to myself and he said, oh, hmm. so I read it to my parents and they looked at me and they said, you you wrote that? And I said, yes. And from there, from that point. Um, you know, my mother, oh my goodness, very, very extremely instrumental, mm -hmm. you know, even to this day, she's just continuing. She's the, the, the behind the scenes cheerleader, right, right, right. She buys me notebooks. She buys me journals, um, just from a child. That was one thing that she would always instill in me to do was to write, you know, I would have a dream. Did you write that dream down? I would see something in the street. Did you write that down? <laughs> so it was always that reinforcement to write. Um, from that moment, she saw that I could do that, that I could put the words together to formulate a poem, a story, a song. She was just constantly reinforced. So from a young child, maybe about fourth or fifth grade, I would write. Um, throughout high school, I kind of pushed it aside. College pushed it aside. And then once I started getting into the acting world, Mm -hmm. um, that's sort of when I, my interest peaked again. At, and maybe within the last 10 or 15 years, I've been taking it more serious. Um, you know, writing plays and writing poems and, you know, with the creation of the, the children's book that I have now as well. So just from childhood up until now, um, it's just something that's been a part of my life. Right. You know, one of the things that I've learned real quick as a writer is that you never know when a thought process is going to happen. And as you mentioned earlier, you should always have a notebook and pad. I mean, you may be yes. in a shower, you may be in a shower, you may be driving, <laughs> you may be daydream daydreaming on a job, uh, you may be at the park. I mean, you, you can watch television. You know, a thought process can just thought process can just hit you just like that. <laughs> yes, yes, and you know, it's so funny you say that because the other day, 
I was in the shower and an idea hit me for a workshop that I wanted to do. And I said, well, I can't jump out of shower. <laughs> you know what I mean? I was like, I, but I, I, I hurried because I said, I got it. I got it. I got to remember it. And then what I did was I jumped out and I ended up writing these words on a piece of paper. They might not make any sense, but they do to me because okay. it means something. Okay. But I had to write those words down. I had to get them down on paper. So I just grabbed a piece of computer paper and just put the, those words down because they, it was an idea that had come to me. So yes. <laughs> yeah, you got, you got nice, you got nice handwriting there too. <laughs> oh, thank, thank you. Years of Catholic school training. <laughs> now, now one of the things that is difficult for, for writers is, is having writer's block. Uh, you know, you're writing and you make it stuck. Um, a, do you get writer's block? And if so, uh, what do you do to overcome that writer's block? Hmm. Yes, I do. Um, yeah. Uh, what I often have to do is just take a step back from the work um, and just have a time or a moment where I can just think about where I am in the process of that work. Um, and I, I think that's the best thing, just stepping back, thinking about the work, thinking about maybe some things that can be tweaked. And when I do that, oftentimes that generates more ideas and then I can go back to the work. But oftentimes taking that healthy step back, whether it be for a day or two, um, sometimes it's for months, um, just to clear your mind, mm -hmm. to, to get new thoughts, to get new ideas generating through your mind and then returning back to the work. Because sometimes you just have to step away. Um, when you get those moments of blockage, just right. step away and then regroup, come back to it, but right. never leave it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because, you, because you leave it, it can be sitting there for years. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Oh, right. So what is it called? Furry mouse? Did I get it right? Yes. <laughs> uh, furry mouse. The, the furry mouse, that, that, that uh, best-selling book you got out there. Talk about okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for calling it best-selling. Amen to that. Mm -hmm. um, so... Furry Mouse. Wow. Um, it's interesting because Furry Mouse was not supposed to be my first um, piece oh, on the wow. market. Okay. It was okay. not. Um, I have another series about a little boy, and that was supposed to be what I wanted to be at the forefront. It's about a little boy named Will, and he's always getting into stuff. Mm -hmm. um, that was what I wanted to be out. But, okay. <laughs> but, what ended up happening is um, in 2016, um, an unfortunate event happened in February. I got laid off from my job. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that was, it was very traumatizing. And, um, you know, it's interesting because prior to that, I had been praying and I said, God, I said, I feel like I don't have time to write. I don't have any time to write. And a month or so later, this layoff came. I said, God, that's not what I meant. <laughs> I didn't mean you lay me off. But you know what? That cleared up space for me to write. And so I sat down and I, I started looking through things that I had. And I thought um, I, I was in a house. I was living in a house at that time. And the house had an issue with mice. Ooh. And um it wasn't overrun with mice, but there was enough, there's maybe like two and a half. That was too much for me, right? There were two, at least two in that house. And it was traumatizing for me because I would see them and I would like have to call people up to come and get them or get me out of the room. I mean, it's fear, it can be paralyzing. It's a terrible thing. Mm -hmm. And people would try to coax me and say, Tiffany, the mouse is this big, you're this big. But when you're dealing with a fear, it doesn't matter. You it's know, phobia. It's the, yeah. yes, it's the, it's the largest thing in the world. Um, so I said, you know what? I'm gonna write about this mouse and, but I'm not gonna make him scary. I'm not gonna make him fearful. He's going to be a playful mouse. He's a yeah. cute mouse. He's a furry mouse. Um, so that's what I did. I developed this little, this story, semi-autobiographical about this woman who encounters this mouse in her home and every, and all of these solutions that she tries to put in place to get rid of him. But it's done in a lighthearted way um, for children. 
Um, but it gets them thinking about maybe some of the things that they're frightened of and mm -hmm. what things and solutions they can possibly put in place to combat that fear. Um, and that's what the story does. Um, again, it's lighthearted, it's funny, it's comical, it rhymes. So children are like, ooh, that word rhymes with this word. So, you know, they're, they're looking at the words, they're, you know, they're seeing the mouse, the illustrations are, are really pretty. I love, my illustrators were wonderful. Um, and, you know, it ends on a, a little cliffhanger, but, you know, and I did that on purpose because there's another book coming out, but um, it, it was- part two? Excuse me? Is it a part two, Furry Mouse part two? Um, well, it's not, it won't be called Furry Mouse part two. It's about the cat. There's a cat in the- Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> and oh, her name, her it's name- about to go is, down. Now it's about to go down. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, what happens is in the second story, it's the cat's story, her beginnings. Okay. So um, this was my mother's idea. Again, she's just been very instrumental. Mm -hmm. um, she saw this story, she read it. She said, Tiffany, why don't you build a life for the cat now and make this book a series? I didn't even think of that. Right. Well, that's what and moms so, are for. You get the knowledge and wisdom. <laughs> yes. I said, she says, I hope I'm not being a pest. I said, no, you're not. <laughs> you're giving me wonderful ideas. Keep them coming. And so she has. So. It, the next book is called Nosy Josie. <laughs> it's about the cat. I like that. Well, yeah. let me ask you, what, what fairy mouse, how many chapters is it? Oh, it's a children's book. It's it's a picture book. It's maybe about, oh, 20, oh, oh. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's about, it's about 20, 25 pages. Wow, okay, that, that, that yeah. is awesome. Now, now did, did you have a publisher for this book or did you self-publish? Oh, no, I do have a publisher, um, a friend of mine who actually works with me. Um, she has her own publishing company and she's an author as well. And um, she saw my book and because I was looking for a publisher and she says, Tiffany, she says, I'm starting my own publishing company. We like what we saw in your book and we'd like you to be the first person to come on board with our publishing company. And I said, great, I'm, I'm, I'm in. And so I'm, I'm on, you know, Inkblot, I'm giving her a plug, <laughs> Inkblot Publishing, Inkblot Blot, B-L-O-T, publishing, ink blot. I believe that's it. Yes. And um, she's wonderful. Now, you know, uh, and I, I also written a book called From Tears of Glory, The Stories of Our Lives. It was based on uh, the play um, I did uh, several years ago. Um, and I, I self-published. And, you know, just speaking to people who self-published, one of the things that they raise, issues or concerns that they raise is that going through a publisher Man, it could be a lot of money. And then also publishers change the book around. It's like, I didn't write this. Uh, did, did you experience any difficulties while <laughs> working under the publisher? No, um, actually my publisher is wonderful. Um, she, she liked the book. Well, I mean, there was a few little things, a few little uh, minor things that she wanted to change, but it was nothing where my story was distorted in any way. Gotcha. The message was still very clear. It was more on the rhyming patterns. Like mm -hmm. one of like a couple of the pages, the rhyming pattern was a little off and okay, she made gotcha. suggestions on certain words that could be used in place of others. But otherwise, um, the book still maintains its integrity. Um, you know, the illustrations, there were no major changes to that. Maybe some, a little, a few technical issues, mm -hmm. but she's been, she's been wonderful regarding that. There's never been any issues. We have similar visions on the book. Um, and then she was also very, I loved how she was very sensitive to that. She says, do you mind if we change this? I think this would be better. You know, it was never like, I'm changing this. I'm doing right. this. You're working you know? together. Right. right. It was very much a collaborative process. And um, that was, that's, that's been very good for me because um, again, I, this was my first experience um, having a book published and I didn't want it to be a situation where I felt like the work was compromised. It right. never has been. And I'm most thankful to her. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, that, that is awesome. Now, um, I've seen where you've been going to different places. Uh, you, you got your table, you got the books on the table. You're so <laughs> basically, you're, you're going on tour. Uh, what's that experience been like for you? Oh, it's been wonderful. Um, I would say uh, my first sort of tour um, started in, I believe it was May. Um, it was an opportunity that was presented to me from a, 
a colleague of mine in New York, um, okay. she was going to be having, it was called the Brooklyn Business Bazaar. And she had posted on Facebook that she was looking for vendors. And, um, you know, at first when she reached out to me, I said, no, I don't want to do it. You know, because I was thinking, oh, my goodness, it's going to cost money. I'm going to have to be in New York every Saturday for like eight weeks because it was an eight week gig. So oh, every wow. set, my all my Saturdays from May, June, July, whatever, however long it, the eight weeks were, were consumed with that. That involved me going through Amtrak, you know, every weekend, getting an Airbnb, food, you know. The awesome, book. Yeah. Yes, it's very expensive. And I said, you know what? If I don't do this now, when am I going to do it? Right. So I said, you know what? I'm doing it now. I'm going to sacrifice. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome to be because you never know when another opportunity may, may arise. Exactly. And there were connections made there. Awesome. Um, and it opened up the door um, for book coaching because that's something else that I'm um, starting to move toward. I'm taking some classes so I can be cert a certified book coach. And, oh, I, and, and I met up with someone there who was interested in having me coach them on their book. And that was a relationship established. And that was income coming in. Now, if I hadn't done that opportunity in New York to, to be a vendor, I would have right. never met this person and would have hence right. would have never been their coach. Right. And so that opened up that door. And now I'm still connected with um, this woman um, and she's very successful. Um, she has her own business and she's been a great mentor because she's been someone who's been able to tell me, Tiffany, you need to be here. You need to be there. You need to be doing this. You need to be doing that. She's a wonderful mentor. And I love the fact that she's done it. She's not talking from a place of inexperience, but from a place of someone who is successful at what she does. And that's empowering to me to see that another black woman doing it, living it, experiencing it. Well, that's beautiful. You know, I never heard of a book coach before. I, I never knew they existed. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, yes. There's a program um, online that I've been researching for several years. I could never afford it, um, but they, they, um, they had a program um, couple, uh, about six or seven months ago where they recognized that um, minority book coaches were very underrepresented. Mm -hmm. And they said, you know, their program, they understand is very expensive. So what they did, they, was, they were offering scholarships to people of color to mm -hmm. step on board. And they offered it at a, a, a severely discounted, pr I mean, it was, they like cut it like 80% off. Wow. So then, Exactly. So now I could well, afford it. <laughs> that's almost like free. <laughs> almost, almost. Um, and so, and the first time I applied, I didn't get it. And I was bummed. I said, man, because I didn't, I didn't have furry mouse. I didn't have anything under my belt to show myself as a credible, some, you know, somebody credible. And then once furry mouse came out, I applied for it the second time I got it. And I said, okay, here we go. We're going to do this. And so um, I'm taking those classes now learning um, from other coaches and um, hopefully within the next it's like a eight nine month program I can you know have that credential under my belt and be someone who can can wear that title right and you're also involved with the writers club talk about that yes um, I have a writers group it's called straight from his plate it's a Christian writers group um, actually this that group has been in existence since 2007 October Okay. Um, where when I saw a need, I was working at a Christian school at the time, and it was at the same time I wrote Voices. Um, I wanted a platform where Christians, other Christian writers could come together mm -hmm. to share their works in a place where they could be nurtured and mentored by other people who shared the vision that God's word needs to be dispersed throughout the world. And um, it's we've been going strong since 2007. Initially, we were meeting at a church in Philadelphia. Um, however, um, the group, you know, the, the group kind of took a transition and then, you know, we stopped meeting at the church and then we met at a coffee shop for several years. And then the coffee shop went out of business. Oh. And then we started meeting at Starbucks and then COVID happened. <laughs> so right. now, now we're online, but we're still going strong. And right. um, I'm, I'm just real pleased with what's been going on with that group as well. Right. Uh, going back to uh, Furry, Furry Mouse, uh, when you go, I don't know how many different schools that you may have went to or community centers, when, when you're reading to the children, um, what, what's it like reading your book to children and they, they react, they smile, they laugh? I mean, as a writer, I mean, they got to make you feel so good. 
Yes, it, it really does. Um, I've gone to one Christian school in um, Northern Pennsylvania and I did a program with them and it was just wonderful because the program was fo focused on um, the scripture, 2 Timothy 1, 7, God does not give us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and of a sound mind. And that's what the whole um, program was focused on. I incorporated furry mouse into that. Okay. And just having children share um, about how God's power is enough for them to conquer any fear. And just having their eyes light up when they, you know, talk about that. And then when they see the pictures of the mouse and then they, you know, they, they think some of the, the, you know, illustrations are funny and they, they point and they laugh and they'd say, oh, the words rhyme. They, that rhymed with that word. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, you know, just seeing their faces light up, having them laugh, engaging them in discussion about what they're frightened of and what they're fearful of. And it's interesting because um, children are very honest. <laughs> And they will tell you, they will tell you. Um, and it's just interesting to hear what some of the things that they're fright, you know, frightened of and fearful mm -hmm. of, but what they use, what they put in place um, so that they can combat those fears. So um, that was one, one um, um, engagement that I had. And then another one was at the Brooklyn Business Bazaar. A bunch of children came through on one Saturday Okay. And that was wonderful having, you know, telling them the story and engaging them in discussion. And, you know, um, it, it's just been a, a wonderful experience. I don't have any children of my own, but I feel like now I can reach children. I can have them in my life, even though they're not my own, I can still, you know, reach them and I can still have fun with them and I can still do things with them again, even though I don't have any of my own. So it's, it's been wonderful. Right. So um, now the schools are opening back up. Uh, do you foresee yourself uh, when you're going on tour, uh, you know, going maybe going to different schools, or maybe going to different community centers to, to promote your book and to read more? To yes, there? very much so. Um, I was just at a festival on Sunday in my okay. community, and um, I made some contacts there. Excuse me. And I'm hoping that through some of those contacts, I can get into the schools, whether they be private Christian schools or whether they be public schools, just to do programs dealing with fear, um, okay. especially during this time with COVID, um, people losing their jobs, people contracting COVID, um, children being fearful of contracting it themselves, fear, you yeah. know, and having these discussions with them um, and using the book as a sort of a, um, the core of our discussion. It becomes the, you know, the, the main point and when we branch out from that and just have these engaging talks about fear. Right. So Tiffany, so um, let's go back. You know, you say you got laid off from, from, from your job in 2016 and, and, and you're, that's when you you got an opportunity to, to write more and more and more. So are, are you a full-time writer now? No, I am not. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> okay Did you hear the disappointment in my voice? <laughs> um, so you'll no, get there, huh? you'll no. Get there. Yes. Amen. Um, no, I am not. However, okay. I, I do have a job that I enjoy. Um, I am working with young people um, okay. and I enjoy that job. Um, however, again, it's a job. It's not, it, it's not my passion, right. but, I, but I do it with a passion because that's what I'm called to do for this season. Mm -hmm. And I will be committed to that for this season. But I know there is a season that is coming right. where that will not be a part of the passion anymore. And I'm excited. I'm gearing up for it. I'm prepping myself for it because I want to be ready when it comes. I don't want to be someone who's sitting on the sidelines and say, oh, I can't do that because nope, when it comes, I'm out. <laughs> right. Well, you know, so this, this is what I foresee in you. Um, you're, you're an excellent speaker. So so I, I see the categories of you being a public speaker, as oh. well as an author, as well as, as an actress. So, so that's three different fields that, that you can do primarily at the same time, or you know you can do two at the same time, or all three at the same time, or one at a time. But you, you can be self-employed, uh, just you know, with all the talent that you got. <laughs> Am I right? <laughs> oh, oh, Omar, thank you. That's so sweet. That's that's wonderful. Thank you. I receive all of that. Thank uh -huh. you so much for speaking that into my life. Um, right. Thank you for speaking that positivity. Thank you. Yes. Right. Right. So, so you, you mentioned the support that, that you received from your mother, which is very tremendous. Um, 
Uh, we're a bunch of other family members. I'm not sure if you have siblings or you know, oh, cousins, oh. or, uh, or your, your oh. friends. Um, what, what type of support have they given you uh, oh. with writing and things of that nature? Yeah. Well, my mother is the the pusher, <laughs> the the pusher of the story. Like Tiffany, tell the story, tell the story, tell the story. My father is the one who instilled in me the passion for the story because he is a wonderful storyteller. Um, as a child, he would always tell me stories about his his, you know, growing up in the South and the, the, the um the poems or the stories that I have about the little boy named Will are reflective of his background of where he grew up. Corn Crib, that's based on a story he told me. Um, so again, he's the instiller of the story. Um, so he's been very instrumental. I also have another cousin um, who um, is just wonderful. Um, I call her Jazz. <laughs> Hey Jazz, if she's here, um, she's in North Carolina. Wonderful support. She's a she's a lover of um, literacy books, all things books, and um, she's just an encourager. Every time I post something, she's always saying something positive, positive. Um, and I love that. And I also have another cousin in Virginia, Shonda. She's always, hey, big cuz, you know, I see you doing great things, and these people are just behind me, just you know, giving me love. And just um, I had another friend the other day. He's in um, Michigan, Maurice. We call him Piranha Head. <laughs> the silly, don't, you know, but he's another guy. He's a he's an he's a um, musician. You know, he's also encouraging. And you know, I just have all of these people in my camp. Um, John, um, my heart. <laughs> um, he's also another supporter. You know, I have all of these people again in my camp that that just promote or help me, whether it's through vending whether it's through pushing me to write more, whether it's being just encouraging me to write, whether it's being instilling in me the stories. So I have so many people in my camp that love me and support me through this venture. Do you have any siblings or are you the only child? Um, I do have siblings. Um, I have four, four other siblings. <laughs> okay. Yeah, um, I'm the youngest. <laughs> are they supportive or are they just uh yes um you know we didn't grow up together but they're oh, okay. i guess they're, but they're supportive in their own way um yeah. i have yeah. one especially um derek he's just he's great um he when he when my book first came out he went on facebook and said see sis i got it i got it and he has no kids but okay. he you know lovingly gave it to someone else who had children and he shared it with them and i okay. love him for that you know so um and then, you know, again, my other siblings, I didn't really grow up with them, but I love them all. Um, and, but he's probably been the, the biggest supporter out of them all. Okay. So, um, yeah, so. <laughs> all right, so the book, Fairy Mouse, uh, where can people get it? Can they get it on Amazon? Can they contact you? You send it to them? How are you doing this? Yeah, so what I would prefer them to do is um, go on my website. It's, it's um, rightawayday.com forward slash shop. Um, and if you do that, rightawayday.com forward slash shop, um, it will take you right to the furry mouse page. You can, you know, pick up the book. Um, however, um, well, you know what? That's it. That's where you can find it. Rightawayday.com forward slash shop. Okay. Now, <laughs> I want to ask you also, um, who are the writers that you admire as well as the actors or actresses that you admire? <sighs> <laughs> oh, I love this question. I love it. Oh, actresses that I admire. Hmm. I, I hope I get her name right. Issa Rae. Did I say oh, her yeah. name? Yeah. Issa, Issa Rae. Um, I like her more as a writer. Okay. I like what she writes. I like the message that she conveys about... Awkward girl, right? <laughs> it's me? It's called a Awkward Girl, a Awkward Black Girl. Is that what this is called? Yeah I, yeah, I forgot the series. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but, it, but I but just like she's a big hit though. She, she came yeah. through there. So, uh, yeah. So much. Yeah. Yeah, I, I love what she says about relationships, how they go through cycles and people right. change relationships and because people change relationships change, then the dynamics of those relationships change. Um I like that message that she puts forth. In terms of actresses, um hmm, I've always loved Whoopi Goldberg. Okay, yeah. <laughs> and I know she's more um, a stand-up personality. I know she was on The View for some time, but I liked 
the versatility of roles that she has played across the board and that nobody can really put a stamp on what she's never been typecast. I right. love that. She, you know, she played in The Color Purple, Jumping Jack Flash. She played in Ghost. All three different people all together. Right, right. You know, she's never been typecast. And so many actors get into this thing where, unfortunately, like um, Jean Stapleton from All in the Family, after she did that series as Edith, it was so difficult for people to cast her because they could only see Edith, Edith, yeah, Edith. Mother, yeah, yeah. You know? So um, Whoopi Goldberg, an actress, Issa Rae, writer. Um, if we're going to look at fictional writers, I love John Steinbeck. I love Toni Morrison. Oh, oh. That's a legend. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, I just read um, The Bluest Eye this summer. Powerful book. Oh, yeah, yeah. Powerful. Um, and I love Zora Neale Hurston. If we're going to look at playwrights. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. And, and folklorist. Oh, my goodness. Another woman, just powerful. And I, I love the name Zora, too. Right. Um, and then what it did, I don't know if I answered your complete question, actors, actresses, writers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you did pretty good. All right, so <laughs> before, we, before we end uh, the segment, you want to give your contact information for those who are watching and then any final words of encouragement for those who want to become inspiring writers like you? Sure. Okay, my contact information. Um, my name is Tiffany Joyner. You can find me on Facebook under Tiffany Joyner. You can find me on Instagram at write underscore away underscore woman yeah right away woman but right underscore away underscore woman that's where you can find me on instagram um i also have a website um as i mentioned earlier the but the, just the basic website is right away day.com and on there there's a blog there's my book there's events that i'm doing or have done and um Let's see, I think that's my main contact information. Um, words of encouragement. Um, I told this to some students um, several months ago about writing because they had asked, you know, what do I want it? What can I do? And, you know, if I want to be a writer and things like that. And I, I guess the main thing I'd want to say is don't, don't be discouraged. Um, you know, a lot of people, it went with rejection it takes them um, hard and they can't, yeah, it, they, they go yeah. through this thing where if they get rejected, they want to just throw everything out and be done with it. And I think someone else had said, um, don't throw that away, persist, move on. It's just that the right eyes have not placed their eyes on it yet. Just, you know, if, if 30 people don't like it, you know, keep Boy. on moving because there's going to be one person, the right person, that's going to place their eyes on it, and it's going to be a, it's it's going to be it for them. Right. Like I believe J.K. Rowling went through so many rejection letters and so so much, and mm -hmm. look where she is today because she persisted and she went on because someone the right eyes saw that work and recognized it as a piece of work that could move forward and meet the masses, and it has. Right, right. That was awesome. All right, Tiffany. So it's been a minute since we we, we last talked. So I want to bring you on again sometime in the future. Please. Uh, want to come on whenever you guys have another book. So we definitely uh, stay in touch. And thank you for being a guest. Thank you so much, Omar. Thank you, everyone. It's been a great experience. Have a great night. <laughs> everyone is watching. Please like, subscribe, and share. God bless. Have a safe week. Bye, Omar. See you later. Bye bye. <laughs>